Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. sit with my best friend Tony what's up buddy what's going on brother all that noise that you hear in the background is uh, the Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo um, guess what it's in Salt Lake City day two day two yeah so this is our second day um, day two at a hair show is always fun because you know people come in dragging ass because uh, you know something <laughs> happened the night before or you know especially the artists the, the, the you know what I mean the, the people that are working the show because they get in early they set up they work so hard day one and then they go out to network and, and to the events at, at night. There's an after party or whatever. And then this day two, you see them coming in. Oh, the look, the tired. But it's funny because as soon as, like, the bell rings, tick on the opening bell, you see the energy just re just kind of reinvents and well, well i guess when you do these things you know exactly when the monster or red bull are going to kick in so you know you hit it up right before opening bells <laughs> so you can uh, carry on today, for the day. today's guest has a red bull <laughs> <laughs> exactly um yeah man uh this show is, is really cool you know big shout out to tyler kelbert and michael his i don't know michael's last name but big shout out to those guys for putting this together um we we talked on an earlier podcast that I think this is like the only hair show in like the Mountain Standard Time. So, you know, that, that's pretty cool. So if you're in the Mountain Standard Time or even close to Salt Lake City, I highly recommend it. And if you come here next year, make sure you get an extra day or two so you can explore because it is beautiful. Yeah, I get. We're, look, we came, get we, we came two or three days early and we went down south and we're staying an extra day so we can go up north. So it's you know, you got to do that when you when you come to Salt Lake, <laughs> dude. It's it, there's so much to. I we talked about earlier, like this will be like a go-to show for us just because it's in Utah. You know, we get to experience Utah. Um, so our guest today, I believe she lives in Utah. I believe that that's um, you know. So we we've been friends, and we were just talking about it. We've been oh, so you're saying we got a, a place years. to stay? Next oh time. yeah, we <laughs> got a place. <laughs> oh. Hope she has a couple extra guest rooms. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so our guest today, we've been friends for a few years. We've actually never had her on a, the podcast, which is, uh, you know, pretty cool. So I'm glad we were able to do this. I'm glad also that we're able to do it in your hometown because you, know, you can kind of host us through this. Um, today, our guest is Jessica Powers. Uh, again, Jessica Powers, we've been friends for, for a few years, and I'm just really honored that we're able to speak with her today. Yeah, when, when she was, you know, a part of the whole uh, Blondie and Beyond, you know, and that's that whole crew and uh that's when we she we first really got to meet her and uh got on our radar and, and just watching her just progress from that to where she is today she's uh she's a superstar absolute superstar should yeah. we get in let's do it miss jessica powers welcome to your day off thanks for having me um i like i was telling you guys like it's so awesome that you invited me to do the podcast with you today and i just feel like we're just friends hanging out and it's comfortable and you guys work so hard on making those relationships with artists and so thank you for bringing that back to us to just share our stories and i'm excited to get down and dirty with you today <laughs> let's, get, let's get down down and what well, ain't gonna be that dirty well, Jess, but I mean, we, we can get down yeah. a little bit i gotta be a little professional yeah. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> jesse you're from are you from actually salt lake city or from utah no so i was raised in california and um that's where i met my husband and that's where i started hair school and all of that stuff was when i was in high school it's my senior year of high school and i went to beauty school in northern california so like I grew up in Rockland, Roseville, Sacramento area, and then uh, my husband got a job in Utah, and we moved to Utah in 2018. Yeah, so we've only been here for about seven years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are you, so, are you as enamored with it as we are? 
Like oh, just the beauty beautiful of it. here. And I think people have a hard time that live here really seeing the beauty in Utah. It's like when you live at another state, you kind of take it for granted, right? Sure. And with traveling too, I've been able to see different states and experience different places. And Utah really is one of the most scenic photogenic like beautiful landscape places and I always tell people to come out here whether it's southern Utah or northern Utah with the mountains in the snow or the red rock you're gonna get basically I'm like you're in Mars or you're like in Aspen right, you know yeah, yeah. in Utah it's so crazy oh that's awesome but I want to rewind just a little yeah. bit back to uh, you just, were you going to hair school while you were in high school? I did. So there was a ROP program in my high school. It's called Regional Occupational Program for Trade Schools. And so they had like uh, dental assisting, automotive, and then there was cosmetology. And so I applied for it my junior year of high school. And then I got accepted and started going January of my senior year in 2006. So I started beauty school 17 years ago which is crazy <laughs> were your parents like excited for you happy for you um my parents just always told me that the day i turned 18 i wasn't welcome at their house anymore so i better have it figured out and so that was my figuring it out was Whoa. beauty school yeah so they kick you out on your 18th birthday yeah happy birthday see you <laughs> later yeah really? i moved out a little bit before that um because i was graduated from high school before I turned 18. So my birthday's in September, so I'm a little earlier mm -hmm. in my year. So I had already graduated and I was still going to beauty school and I worked at Taco Bell, it was my first job too. And I actually managed and opened a new Taco Bell store. So I've always kind of been in this leadership role a little bit um, with managing and then um, I had a boyfriend at the time and we moved out and got an apartment while I was still going to beauty school and working at Taco Bell. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's a lot for a young young person. Yeah. You I'm know? just thinking how you managed a Taco Bell at like 18. Yeah. I I don't know. I just I, yeah, did I it. I, yeah, I <laughs> just I I just insert my dominance and authority and I know how to problem solve and I'm very strategic mm -hmm. with handling things. I take customer service very highly too. Um, and so I just walk in and you know show with action first and then demand what I want after. Ooh. How did you beat your husband? I met my husband on MySpace. <laughs> Take it back a What's little that? bit. No, yeah. <laughs> I'm aging myself here. Um, yeah, we met on MySpace actually. And then um, his brother actually went to high school with one of my best friends. And so we kind of just like hung out one night and then we were inseparable ever since. But he's eight and a half years older than me too. And then, so we worked um, or lived in California and I did hair for 10 years. And during that time we got married and I had my two children. My son Hunter is now 10 and my daughter Sienna is eight. And then um, he got the job in Utah. And so it was a big change. I had to leave my clients of 10 years that I had in California and uproot and take the chance and move to Utah. But at that point, it was kind of like, what do we have to lose? You know, we weren't having a lot of support with our kids and stuff and daycare and all of that stuff in California and just the cost of living. Right. We were suffocating, you know? And so we just had to do something different and at that time, we had looked up at the economy and stuff in Utah and housing prices and all of that stuff. And you could get three times the size of house that you could in California for like half the price wow. in Utah. And so we felt like this was just an opportunity. Our kids were young enough. They weren't in school yet. And so let's just take that chance. And if it doesn't work out, then we can always move back, you right. know? Um, and I think a lot of people have a hard time taking those risks and doing those changes, but I literally felt like it was a good opportunity too for him because he was going to be making more money 
in Utah than he was in California. And so we moved there and then I didn't know even where to start. Like we literally didn't know one person when we moved to Utah. Yeah, we just did it. I remember we were driving through the salt flats and I had never even been to Utah (laughs) (laughs) before we moved here too, like never been here. Um, So we're driving from California with our moving truck and everything. We did it in two weeks too. We just decided he got an interview. We moved in two weeks, gave my two week notice at the salon that I was at and then packed up our house and did the drive and we're going through the salt flats between like Winnemucca and Elko and Salt Lake and there is nothing there right it's all flat nothing and my husband's like well we're in Utah now and I'm looking around and I'm like where did you move me (laughs) what is this like hills have eyes like type of (laughs) place you know like where are we going And then we hit Salt Lake, and I was like, okay, I'm comfortable here. We're in the city. (laughs) Um, And then, yeah, and then I had to figure out what I wanted to do. You know, my kids, my daughter was only one, and my son was three. And um, it was interesting. I started adding, like, mom groups and stuff on Facebook just to get opinions on, like, a pediatrician, um, a daycare, stuff like that. And then I found them a daycare and I was only comfortable with working part time. And so I put them in daycare for two days a week and then I needed to figure out where I wanted to work. Right. Because I hadn't even found a salon yet when we moved. Were you consider not doing hair or like you knew that you're going to do hair? I mean, I wanted a break. Or were you looking for a Taco Bell to open here Uh, No, (laughs) no. I did not want to work at Taco Bell anymore. No shame on Taco Bell. It was a great place. But um, uh, I knew that I wanted to do hair, but I didn't have the anxiety of feeling like I had to do hair Mm. to provide like I did in California. And when after I had my kids um, with Hunter... I was in a studio like Sweet, and I was part owner. And after I had him, I had a C-section, but I was still paying my rent because I was part owner, that I literally went back to work when he was two weeks old. Mm. Yeah. So I didn't have the time to really take the time to sit and like be a mom when I first became a mom with him because of the pressure of having to work and had to, having to provide, right? And then with my daughter, I moved salons and I actually had more of an opportunity. I went back to a commission-based salon. um, And then I was able to take like the seven weeks off with her. So I had more time with her. And so when we moved, it was nice to kind of have that release and that, you know, breath of fresh air of being like, you don't have to work. But my husband said... I know you're going crazy (laughs) being at home and you need that adult conversation, that release, all of that stuff, that artistry, that passion, feeling like you're doing something bigger than yourself and helping others. But I still wanted it to be part time. But the frustrating part for me is that there weren't a lot of commission based salons in the Ogden area, right? I was looking around and looking around and looking around and everything was like booth rental. And that was scary because I didn't know one person moving here, but also I didn't want to work at like a chain salon. You know, I felt like I had done my time like doing that for a decade in California. And I really wanted to kind of rebrand myself and build a clientele off of like who I am now as an artist after 10 years and what I really want to be doing behind the chair that's going to make me feel like leaving my kids is worth it. Did you find uh, hair was completely different from where you came out of California to where you are in Salt Lake? Yeah, we kind of kid around that Utah's about five, six years behind the trends on things. So I ended up finding a booth rental salon in South Ogden, and that's where I first worked, but I only did three days a week. And my husband challenged me in that moment and said, 
I want you to be able to do your passion, but I don't want it to take away from our family. Like I want you to make enough mon money to cover your booth rent, cover your products, and cover the kids' daycare, right? To make it worth it. And it was nice that he did do that because it made me step up and really work hard to try and get clients. Right. And I had already added these um, groups on Facebook, these mommy groups and stuff on Facebook to find the daycare, all of that other stuff. So I was like, why don't I use these groups to post my Instagram and post my work and I'm gonna be doing specials and stuff like that just to get somebody in my chair to try and get my name out here because I don't know anybody, you know? Right. And I did that. And then um, in about three months, I was able to like close my books off Whoa. because I had that many clients book for three days a week that I was at the salon. And then I was like, all right, no more specials, price <laughs> increase <laughs> sure. when that happened. And some people fell off, but I had a waiting list at that point too. So then I was able to bring people in that were on the waiting list that I couldn't fit in because I was still only working three days a week at that point. And then kind of fast forward about nine months, I was kind of stagnant, right? You know, you hear that saying when you feel like you're the best in the room, it's time to like change rooms type mm. of thing. And also I, I had been balayaging, I had the ring light, I had my social media page, all of that stuff already kind of set up because I was from California that the salon in Utah that I was at, I remember one lady asked me when I pulled out the ring light, she's like, so are you like a photographer or something? Like what's going yeah. on here? <laughs> or remember when we, the paint brushes were a big thing to balayage with, right. going to Home Depot and doing the paint brushes. And so I pulled those out and everyone looked at me like, what is this chick doing? <laughs> you know, but it was really cool because they approached me at that point and asked me to teach a class for the salon and I had only been there for like three or four months and I had never taught a class before at that point. And so my first class that I ever did was at that salon and it was just a salon class and I just charged them like $30, $40 and I provided the product and they brought a mannequin head and I did a model and that was probably the first time that I really saw my potential of where my future could go in the education realm of doing hair. That's awesome. For sure. Were you nervous at all in your first class? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, I yeah. was so nervous. But it was cool because also it was around people that I was working with every day, right? So, But aren't they some, sometimes they're the hardest audience, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, especially when you're an owner. <laughs> now, I mean, fast forward there, but um, yeah, I feel like I feel like at the same time, what's going to resonate with someone is their choice of what's going to resonate with them. And I always say, if I learned something in a class, whether it be something positive or something that I take away that I'm like, oh, I don't want to be like that, or I don't want to do that, that's still a learning moment sure. for me. So I just look at it as you never know what you're going to teach or what you're going to say that's going to resonate with someone. So don't filter yourself by leaving the small stuff out because sometimes the small stuff is the aha moments right. when you're educating and teaching. And you don't know what some, you don't know what somebody else's small thing is. Right. Right. right? Everyone's brain is different. I mean, we were talking about learning and how people learn differently and stuff like that. So maybe someone heard it, one time but it didn't stick because they want to go in and they want to get their hands in it and then once their hands are in it even though they're hearing the same thing because their hands are busy it's sticking in their brain more you know yeah we were talking about um you know some people are like you know you learn just by hearing you know some people oh, yeah, learn by right, right. seeing you know some people learn by reading you know like like all the different types of uh you know and she said you know she, she's a reader you know, she has to learn by reading in the sense of like, you know, 
information, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we listen to audio books. Yeah, you know, I have the audio book for it. It, re- it reminds me of a story, and I'm going to throw him under, not under the bus necessarily, <laughs> but I'll, I'll embarrass him for a sec, is that um, when we did a podcast with uh, Philip Wolf, and Philip said that he had learned this, like, and it's funny because it's what he posts about all the time, but, like, this, this like, slide, like, technique through the, you know, through the face and, like, how he couldn't get it, couldn't get it, couldn't get it, and then Tony taught him how to do it, and then he goes, oh, and then it clicked, and he goes, that, that was it. And it's so, and I know for me, I get tickled whenever he posts about doing it, because I also get to see it every day in the salon, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was, it's just, you know, just cool for us, you know. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. But, but that was it. That's cool, man. So did you, after that, like, did you get the bug? Did you get the education bug? Oh, yeah, for sure. And then I was like, at that moment in time, I was like, I need to do something bigger. You know, mm. I need to bring something bigger to Utah. Not only was it, the artists that were working in that salon asking me for help and asking me for a class, but the clients that were coming in that I had to fix from stylists that just weren't educated enough doing what people were asking, Mm -hmm. you know, and I had been there. I, I was in a studio salon in California and I had just had my son barely making it. I couldn't afford education back then. It's not like it was, is now, you know, like education is everywhere. You can pay a $20 monthly thing and have this whole university of this education provided for you now. Back then it was like Guy Tang on YouTube. That was it, you know, which was awesome. But, like, also at that point, it was, like, unless you're, like, kind of in that YouTube world, social media wasn't where it is now, you know. So I I have had clients come in and show me a picture and feel devastated or down about myself because I didn't know how to perform that service for them or that technique because I was in a studio – by myself isolated for two years and also barely making it that and just become a mom you know what I mean so like all of those things that like that can make somebody want to quit right doing hair at sure. that point and I almost did you know a, a few times because of the defeat feeling of not being able to perform and do what you need to do for your clients or not being able to make enough money or whatever. So when I saw clients coming in that I had to fix their hair and do it differently, I was like, I need to bring more education. I need to make an impact, a community in Utah somehow. And the way that I thought that that was going to happen was opening a salon first Mm. and building the community and the brand of a small unit of people first so when you opened the salon was it was it was is it a commission was it a commission-based salon or was it like a a booth rental type space so the salon it was funny it was this random chick on uh, Facebook just messaged me one day I don't even know how we became friends. I think I was just adding everybody at that point (laughs) to just get friends on Facebook in Utah. And she owned a salon in like West Jordan or West Valley or something. It was about an hour away. And she's like, I have this second location that I'm not able to take care of. Would you want to take over the lease for me? And we had only been in Utah for about a year at that point. So I was like, Were to you my, still three days a week? I was still three days a week wow. at that point. But I looked at my husband and I said, look at this space. It's 2,000 square feet. It was very outdated. It had been probably eight or nine different salons in 10 years that they've had it. So wow. huge turnover, right? They couldn't keep owners. Um, it, it you, was, wait, hold on, hold on. Let's look. Yeah. <laughs> did, you, did you know that going into it? Did you know that it had been eight? S- s- yes. Really? Yes. Because I would have walked away. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Like, like I don't, I, I, I never think there. I'm the smartest person in the room. Yeah. And I'd be like, if there was eight other failures here. Yeah. Yeah. I walked up and I saw they had a shredded banner that had barber on it. That was probably a year or two faded. They had a sign outside that said 995 haircuts. 
that's the type of salon mm-hmm. that they were running. I mean, when I went in there on their back bar, they had Garnier fruit teas. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. So it was just, it was dirty. It was, it was not great, but I saw the potential and I believed in what I had so much that I was willing to take the risk. And like you, like when you said you had so much, like you mean like your skill and what you had to offer? Yeah, and how much people were looking to me to, I guess, provide that for mm-hmm. them and bring that for them. And I also was hearing like, you know, beauty schooling teaches you so much and there's no education in Utah. We need this, you know, stuff like that. And I was in a commission-based salon in California. And I think with commission-based salons, it is easier to get education if you are there because they have points and systems with brands and stores and stuff. So we were a Wella-based salon in California and we got Wella education like every three months coming in, teaching us stuff. Where in Utah, because there's not a lot of commission-based salons, they don't get a lot of education because a lot of it is independent, right? And then there wasn't a lot of educators and education in Utah, so then they would have to travel outside and do all of that. It's expensive. It's expensive. And, and the closest place probably be like Vegas or something, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, IBS in Vegas, I think, is the closest show yeah. outside of now the Salt Lake Beauty and Barber Expo. So what was now. that conversation like? Because, you know, a year before, your husband's like, I want you to do this. I want you to follow your passion. Mm-hmm. But I don't want you to take care. I, I, you know, I want you to be able to you know, still be a part of the family and stuff. And now the proposal is, if I'm hearing you right, the proposal is, hey, I'm going to travel a, a, an hour away every day. That's two hours round trip. Uh, and I'm going to have to rebuild a clientele because no one from Ogden is coming to Salt Lake City. Or few are coming, you know, certainly not a book. Right. Mm-hmm. So you have to re- rebuild your book. And then. Um, and then, you know, that you believe that you could do this because now there's so much more outgoing cost. It's not just daycare anymore. Your expense isn't just daycare anymore. Right. Well, and that was a learning curve within itself. Nothing can prepare you uh, for how expensive salon ownership is. <laughs> uh, but, but I think me not knowing and almost being naive was better because I didn't overthink it so much and I didn't get in my head about it, right? I also showed my husband through action that I was able to book myself three days a week solid and then raise my prices only after three months of moving here, right? So he saw that. It wasn't just me having these ideas and just throwing it out here. It was showing that Utah needs it and we need more, you know? And we ran the numbers, too. I mean, like I said, I was being naive, and I was just looking at how much I was paying in booth rent and then how much I could afford the lease if we only had two booth renters in there, right? So if we could afford this 2,000-square-foot space where at that point there were 15 stations in that space and then we had um, three rooms that are like private suites that I could sublease out for tattooing, lashes, nails, any of that stuff and they could kind of make it their own little studio room in that area. So I just saw the potential of what it could be and I was in love with the idea of what I could make it. And, and we're still here. <laughs> um, yes. What? So, so you, so the salon that you're in currently is the same, is the same little space. Yes. And how long have you been open? So we are celebrating our seventh year on, uh, or no, our sixth year. Sorry, on uh, November first. That's amazing. Yeah, so we made it through COVID Mm -hmm. (laughs) and everything, too, because nothing could prepare you for that. Also, like, leading up to that, um, because it was so outdated, there was a lot of renovations and stuff. That's what I was going to go next. How did you you factor that into your budget as well? So I knew that I didn't want to go into debt with our business because that was what 
kind of pushed us out of California was that we went into a lot of debt, you know, and we needed to get out of it. So during that year before the salon that I found the salon and opened the salon, I paid off all of our debt. Um, and I knew I didn't want to get into a position where we had these bills and all this overhead and had to rely on people in the salon to pay for those things. So thank God I didn't do that or else COVID <laughs> would have been way harder. Um, we just took every weekend and every evening and we slowly started to renovate the owners of the, it's like in a strip mall and they own the little strip mall. And so I worked with them because they also have seen all of those salons come sure. and go, right? And I said, we need to update this place. What are you willing to do to work with me? And they said, give me numbers. Let's sell the old stations. You rip them out. We did all of the work, right. uh, manual labor. We, One of the rooms, it wasn't even... Um, we weren't able to use it. It was used as storage because it had carpet in it, right? And so we can't do what we do industry-wise in a carpeted room. And so when we pulled up that carpet, the foundation wasn't level. So Ooh. then we had to lay down cement and level out the foundation. And the stations were actually glued to the wall. And so when we ripped those off, it took the wall off. So we had to, like, rewall it. I mean, it was... A whole thing we took about a year and a half slowly remodeling and doing things to the salon which was really crazy <laughs> also and um, and then yeah and then actually after having the salon only for a year then my husband lost his job oh, that no. we moved to Utah for so at that point, the salon had been open for a year. We had uh, probably 80% full of booth renters. Mm -hmm. And I knew I wanted a booth rental salon because I couldn't afford a commission salon yet at that point because I didn't have an investor. You know, it was just us just trying it, see what will happen. And there's more investment and more money you have to put into a commission-based salon to be able to provide the hair color, all of that stuff. Sure. And so I just wanted to kind of figure out how to run a business successfully first, almost by myself, and then have everybody else booth rent and run their own business under the umbrella of Blank Canvas. So was there was there a consideration that you would start it off as a booth and then move to commission? Um, I want a commission salon eventually, but I want it probably to, not in this space though. Not in this space. I want it to kind of be a hybrid salon. I want it to be like a commission based salon where I go in and I mentor and I train and I elevate stylists so they have their own artistry to it but they have structure and they all have the same structure and then they bring in their artistry from that and then once they reach to a certain point then they can upgrade if they will and still work under blank canvas but have their own little suite or something attached to it were you worried when your husband lost his job that his next job is going to be out of the area or sacramento yeah, yeah we go back to california <laughs> Well, at that point, I had actually got on with a brand and I started educating and traveling more with the brand. And then the salon was about 80% full at that point too. And so it kind of almost fell right into place where I was like, hey, let's just see if you staying home with the kids is where it's at at this point, you know, because I'm traveling, educating. I still want our kids to have structure. I don't want someone else raising them. And I also want to see what would happen if I don't have a limitation of like your job and your priority is holding me back. Right. So that was um, four, four or five years ago, I think, that he's been a stay at home dad now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Dude, I should have married you. I would love to be a stay-at-home dad. 
Yeah. Well, he has to come and help set up the booth <laughs> and all this stuff and deal with my meticulous ass. So uh, no, he has a like, job. He has yeah, a, no. a full-time job being a daddy and doing all of the things that I need him to do. And, you know, it was, it was funny. His jobs were, you know, we moved to Utah off of his job, but he was never fulfilled. He was an IT, like, kind of tech guy, you know, and would help solve electrical problems and stuff like that um, digitally on the computer. But he never felt like it was his passion, right? right? So he's seeing me live my passion of something that I love so much, and then I'm able to, like, make money off of it. He said it would be selfish of him to want to still work and limit me when he's not passionate about what he does, right? Mm -hmm. And so he said, actually staying home with our kids, he's able to find that this is his purpose and his life. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Dude, yeah. Yeah, don't think I was throwing shade. I wasn't yeah. at all. <laughs> I, that, well, that, people throw cool. shades, so I got to back it up no, <laughs> no, 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 no. a little bit. Not, not from this guy. No. You know, like, I get it. <laughs> that, that, that's, that, that's pretty cool. Yeah, you it's know? really cool. It's really cool because I think it takes a really strong man and person to be able to, like, do that and remove their ego from it and say, yeah, I'm going to support and elevate my wife. Why would I hold her back? when this is something that she's so good at and passionate about, like, you know? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's very cool. So um, you were saying that, um, I, and I just know from from us knowing each other, yeah. you know, I know that you, you've brought in a lot of education. So is that still a goal? Like, even though you're not a commission salon, mm -hmm. is to bring that education? Yes. And, then, and then how are you affording to bring that in if you're not, if you don't have like brand support with that? So for education um, with the salon, I always waive my fee. So a lot of the time with my work and stuff that I've done and the relationships that I've built with other people in the industry. Like that other are artists. All other artists that are amazing educators. I say, let's do a collaboration class and we'll open it up to the public and the public will pay both of our fees, we'll combine it. And then for the salon, I'll waive my fee off for the salon and then they pay for that other artist to come in. So they get like a 50% discount off of it. Um, also like brand stuff is pretty amazing. We actually are hosting a watch party for the Color the World event on Sunday. Oh, so on top of all of this, I'm hosting the watch party and Presley Poe's actually going to be announcing our salon and Cosmo yeah. Prof is coming to our salon. It's their first in-house watch party at our salon. We actually talked to Cos about that, and they were oh. they were kind of telling us like what was happening. And I remember them bringing up her salon now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that I think about it, yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. So it, to me, it's about the relationship that you have with others, and then them seeing what I'm bringing and how I'm making my salon different. That they want my salon to be attached to like their brand, right, you know, right, right. and help to elevate that. Also, I think it's really cool for salon owners to see what I'm doing um, because even though we are a booth rental salon, they still represent my brand of Blank Canvas. Even though they're their own individual artists, they're still under the umbrella of Blank Canvas. And so if I don't care, they won't care. Right. And I have to lead through example. And my example is showing up, making those relationships, those connections, and also educating and continuing education for at, myself. At this point now, can you select who you want to rent your chair? Yes. I mean, yeah, because I, I would think that, you know, you're, you set yourself s s apart from everybody else, mm -hmm. and all the hairdressers around has to kind of see what you're doing and it's probably you, you have a waiting list for people to come into the shop and to be able to select you know people that you would want to rent the chair or rent the booth uh it's pretty pretty strong because you're going to surround yourself with people that want to do what you're doing right right and when we first got the salon there were people there 
that were working there because I took over basically her lease, right? And she had taken over um, the last person and kept the same people there, sure. right, that were doing 995 haircuts. And so when I went in, I... I unfortunately had to fire everybody, you know, because I was like, I were they all, were they all commission based? They were all booth rental too. Okay. There, um, so I went in and I said, "Look, I'm I'm flipping this place. I'm making it all different aesthetically, um, artistry, all of that stuff. I'm changing it all completely. And if you want to come in and do an interview, and you're gonna have to do a demo for me to be hired." Um, I'm willing to like do that for you. If not, this is your last day. And uh, okay, know. so what was more nervous, the first <laughs> class you taught, or when you had to go in and fire everybody for the first time? Uh, the first class I taught. Really? I think because when I went in and fired everybody for the first time, I didn't know these people. I feel like. Yeah, but you understand you know, they have families and well, they have. Well, yes, but also <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Like, I feel like when you have a more of an emotional connection with a human, it's harder for you to be like, this isn't working. But I also gave them an opportunity that if they wanted it, they could come and demo. You really Look, I know. Oh, but like, I can see a picture of this California gangster that comes into the shop. All these little oh sweet families. Oh, out, out, oh. out. It wasn't. It that, wasn't like that at all. Is there, is there, is there like a that. homeless shelter over there in West Jordan? <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not from West Jordan. But isn't that where your salon is? No, it's in Ogden. Oh, your salon's in Ogden. Yeah, the oh, how's the homeless shelter I, there? Yeah, the chick that I got the salon from lived in West Jordan oh, and had to travel. Oh, okay. And that's why she said, "Would you want to take it over for me?" Got yeah. it. I, I thought it was the other way around. That's yeah. why I was like, "Hey, husband, I'm traveling an hour, yeah. two hours each way." No. Okay, I get it. Yeah. I get it now. No. Dude, it was that like makes so much more minutes. sense. Yeah. So Je Jessica filled the homeless shelter. No, my God. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would never do that. Don't. No, you did do it. I know, but no, <laughs> I didn't. All these little kids running around the homeless. Stop. Center. How many people worked there? It was only like four. Okay. Four or five. There was one. Well, so you didn't one totally fill girl. up. No, yeah, no. Them. <laughs> there wasn't that many. There was one nail tech that kind of gave me sass about it. But other than that, everybody else un understood. So how does that work? Like, I assume they have leases too. Do those, do those leases cease and desist the moment you take over? I have no idea the structure wise of what the other business was, but from what I was told was that they were already there from the previous owner. And when she came in to own it, she literally did nothing. They were still working there sure. and just kind of having an absent owner and them just coming and going whatever see fit of just like a place where you could do hair you know right. there was no leadership there was no guidance there was nothing they were just coming in doing ten dollar haircuts and then leaving so so you fill the homeless shelter <laughs> you're standing in there by yourself doing hair like like what did how did you promote that you were doing this and not only are you doing it but you're going to do it different and it's going to be different and ogden's never seen such a place before mm -hmm. right like so how did you start to fill those those seats and um yeah let's get there yeah i mean at first it was it was harder to know where i was gonna go right because at that point still I was still doing color corrections and like fixing things from other stylists that I really hadn't found truly like where I wanted to take blank canvas but at that point I knew that I wanted it to not be vanilla <laughs> and like everything else because I also was a booth renter before that and I also looked at all these different salons in this area before I decided to go work at one salon. And so I really analyzed of like what I would want to attract if it was me to work at my salon and thought of it that way. Just like with building your clients, you post what you want to attract when it comes Got to it. your clients. So you do the same thing with your marketing of your business of um, your salon ownership and just showing how it's going to be different too. And I think I've always just kind of been unapolog unapologetically myself. 
And I feel like in Utah, there's such this stigma that you have to fit into this perfect mold of what everyone wants you to be. So when I moved here and I, I'm me, <laughs> I show up as myself, I'm automatically going to draw those people right. to me because they're going to be attracted to my vibe. Kind of to the outcast of like what, yes. what, 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 what the I rest of I call some misfits of Utah. <laughs> yes, I love Our it. Son. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. That's cool. So how long was it before you had your first booth renter? Um, I had my, I had three booth renters ready to go the day I opened the door. Wow. Because I took two or three weeks painting the walls, cleaning it, all of that stuff. You mean your husband did? No. (laughs) He stayed home and watched Watched the the kids. kids. (laughs) Well, I did that. I mean, he did a lot, but... Bless his heart. I, I have to fix a lot of things that he does. Oh, so snap. I uh, she's I, doing color corrections <laughs> on the walls. <laughs> yeah. So I I am working on being not being such a perfectionist um, and allowing others to help me. Uh, but a lot of it uh, it was my vision. It's my baby, and the salon is mine. And he's my supportive partner sure. along the way. So a lot of that was my responsibility of taking that on. And he supported me by handling everything at home for us. So I marketed myself and, and posted. And I mean, deciding a name for yeah. your business, like that's a lot of weight too. You know, that's going to stick around. Forever, hopefully. Forever. And if you try to rebrand or, you know, stuff like that, then it's hard and you have to separate yourself. So I was, I was trying to decide even what I wanted to name it and have it be something different than what everything else is. What was your final two? Um, I don't know what my other one was. I, to be honest, I just knew that I wanted it to be about art and about painting and have it be edgy and something different and I was like already making the reference before I even opened blank canvas that your hair is a canvas and whatever the canvas color is when you add paint to it that's like the underlining pigment or the residual color or whatever of explaining that to clients and so I just, it just dawned on me one day and I said, how about Blank Canvas Salon? And then I looked it up and made sure that no one in Utah had that same name and then went through that whole process of getting it done. And then I had to brand it and then make a page on it and then post on it and do all of that stuff. And I really felt like at that time, no one was doing what I was doing in Utah six years ago, you know? so many people said that they wouldn't be able to be successful or make money doing vibrant creative color in Utah because of how conservative it is and I said no there's places that are conservative but there's misfits sprinkled all in there there's misfits everywhere yes right so if we're attracting those misfits like We can't have everybody in Utah coming to our salon, right? So how are we going to captivate the, I guess, small minority of people, but enough people to come to our salon that will be able to fulfill their needs in this 2,000 square foot space? And so I just started marketing and advertising on, on that. And I think people were excited that something new was coming. Someone that wasn't from Utah's bringing, bringing something different. And I wanted it to kind of be like a Salt Lake, urban downtown type of fill, but up into Ogden where it's more suburbs. Mm, that's cool. Yeah. That was cool. That's really cool, actually. Thank you. That's cool. So then, how did you? I mean, there's so much going on. You know? I know. So how did you get into? How did you get into like a brand education? And I mean, we see you everywhere, so mm-hmm. we know that you're on the road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the first time that I really got into brand education was actually after the salon had opened, and that's when um, Pulp Riot was 
popping off mm -hmm. and they asked um, Cindy was our salon centric rep and I was really good friends with her and she come in a lot and all of that stuff and she knew off of our brand and our aesthetic that this is where Pulp Riot should education should be if it's in a salon in Utah yeah. here and so she reached out to me about having a class at my salon for Pulp Riot Faction 8 and I had already entered contests and done all of that because I connected with the vibe of the brand. And then Amanda Harsh came to my salon and taught a Faction 8 class at that point. And then because I was educating already and do it using their product and stuff, um, that's shortly after that class is when I got the Riot Squad box. And then that's when I started going to the trainings, the Pulp Riot mm -hmm. trainings from there. And then that's when they placed me in salon-centric classes and stuff like that. So it just kind of elevated so and So you started on. at the salon-centric classes representing Pulp Riot, mm -hmm. and, then, and then that stage grew for you mm -hmm. from there? Yeah. Yeah. So then I... Um, yeah, did the salon center classes. I did, um, they did, oh man, the name of it, I don't know. There was, at the Monarch, I did um, a big show presentation for them. I think there was 300 people there too. Which was that when they were like touring, the, like the yes, Pulp Riot tour? Yeah, they were doing the tour and stuff like yeah. that. So then I did that and then I worked. Did other artists come in for that as well? Other pulp artists? Um, yeah, uh, Sarah does Hera. Uh -huh. I educated with her and she's like in Murray, Salt Lake area, mm -hmm. like down here too. Um, and so she was an artist in Utah as well. And then, then my first booth that I ever worked was for Pulp Riot at BTC in Washington, D.C., if you remember that show. Oh, yeah, we yeah. were there. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah we were you were there. there. So I, uh, that was my first booth that I had ever worked. Whoa. And I went to trade shows and stuff like that in California. You know, ISSE is huge in California. And so I would always walk by booths and see these platform artists. And I always just said to my dad, I want to be there. I want to be there. Like, I want that for myself. And I think working really hard as a mom, too, um, I think people try to put you in a box a lot of the time and tell you that you should be home and you should be a certain way, you should act a certain way, you, you know, be vanilla, <laughs> as I like to say. And I felt like my mom was a single mom and worked a lot, but she hated her job. And because she hated her job, she was very resentful of her life because she felt like she was working but hated every day of her work. And then that transpired into her relationships with friends and family, even her kids, you know, because she was maxed out and exhausted because she's a single mom having to provide. So for me, I, Want, I am so obsessed with our industry and everything where you can take it that I know my kids see me work a lot, but they see me happy too and passionate about it. And to me, that's the difference, you know, is yes, I work a lot, but I also have my husband home. That is our stability. And I always say I kind of want to change the narrative, even with creative color. That's why I did the hashtag on Instagram, that creative color is professional, because we are the ones that are going to have to change that narrative for our industry, just like tattooing and stuff is becoming okay. Like police officers can show their tattoos and stuff now, and it's not looked down on, but that's because tattoo artists have been pushing that. and wanting that narrative to change and that mindset to change and so for me sharing my story about my husband staying home and me being the provider and working and all of that stuff and also with creative color is people don't know unless you educate and share 
the things and then you also lead by example and showing how you've been successful showing how i am still professional here doing this podcast with you today and i have pink hair right. you know what i mean <laughs> so it takes us to change that narrative and um i think i think it's working how did how did it feel when you uh won the uh one shot award Oh my God. (laughs) It was crazy when I won the first year. So I won in um, 2021 and then I won in 2022 too. So it was back to back. In 2021, I won for the creative color mannequin um, category. And that one was right after COVID. And that they actually did a surprise um, category. That wasn't a category that you could enter when you were entering was the mannequin category. But they saw so many people at home still trying to stay inspired and doing hair and art at home that they made the category after that to like celebrate the people that were still expressing themselves and still finding their love for hair and not losing that while they were home. And I had no idea that I was going to win. Like, literally, you hear so many things about you have to be on the BTC team and all of this stuff. Like, I swear Mary still doesn't even know who I am, to be (laughs) honest. You know what I mean? Like, for me, I'm like, don't devalue the artists that have pushed themselves to elevate because if anything it's just elevated me and my brand even more from winning and aesthetically you can look at my image and tell that it's my image Mm -hmm. online you know back a few years ago everyone was watermarking Mm -hmm. everything so people knew it was their work but the fact that you can tell that it's my work off of my aesthetic is really hard to do because it takes a lot of consistency in posting that way and styling that way, but, and, you know, camera and, you know, clarity and all of that other stuff. But um, I had no idea that I was going to win. So I was crying like Kim K on the stage. I watched the video back, I'm like, oh my God, it's so cringe. But it's so raw, you know, like I literally wrote my speech an hour before I got ready that night to go because I was like, I have to have something, right? Just in case. Because I'm going to stand up there for an hour and then probably not thank my husband in that hour. You know what I mean? (laughs) So I had to have like a little something kind of written down and, um, it was it was a pretty surreal, crazy moment for me. So it was pretty awesome. That's awesome. And then when I won in um, 2022 was my model, actually, that I did at the Salt Lake Beauty and Barber Expo. And it was my first time on a main stage ever. Oh, wow. And I was educating here and did that model and it was actually very windy in utah that day and i didn't even know if i was going to be able to photograph her to be honest because it was so windy so i just impromptu kind of pushed her in the um, entrance of a of our hotel where there was kind of like a little door like corridor Mm -hmm. right there kind of blocked the wind a little bit and then i just kept shooting even though it was windy because I was so perfectionist and like the hair to be like perfect and you know show it all but it was windy and I just kept shooting on my camera I was just like maybe something will come from this you know and that image is what won the um the one shot to not last this last year but the year before you know it's interesting um, about that story is uh, I know that when um when uh Sarah Jane. When Sarah Jane won an AHA, I know that, that the image that they used was a missed shot. Yeah. Like, like the flash didn't go out, but for whatever reason, that's where the magic lied. Yeah. You know, so like, I think that sometimes, admittedly so, you know, your own perfection can work against you and yes. just like, and ju- but just keep shooting as well. Yeah, just, just keep, keep shooting. shooting. And yeah. I've had to get that kind of out of my brain too, of being like, 
it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be a hair sometimes off or something, you know? But then when you're looking at images off of different lighting, shutter speed, all of that stuff on your camera, you get a different feel and a different aesthetic off of playing with your settings and lighting and, you know, how their hair's going and outside. I like to shoot outside mm -hmm. in natural light, like under an overhang or whatever. And you can't control sometimes the environment. You just have you can to never learn. control the environment. Yeah. Just no, you can't. <laughs> unfortunately, right? I wish we could control the environment here. Uh, but um, yeah, so you just have to work with it. You have to let go of control sometimes, mm -hmm. and then that's where the magic happens. That's where the magic happens. Especially with collaborations too. You know, collaborating with artists. You have to be able to let go control when you're collaborating with other artists. And it can be very intimidating. And if you're very type A and a perfectionist, you're not going to want to collaborate because you're going to lose control. And that's going to make you feel uncomfortable, right? But that's where the learn is. But that's where the learn is. And also, your artists, their artists, they're going to bring something a little bit different that is going to change up your look too and this magic like happens mm -hmm. with collaboration but you just have to be willing to kind of step back when you need to step back sometimes that's awesome hey what? go ahead no 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 no, no. no i'm gonna take us down so go ahead yeah i was <laughs> just say you know as we wind up here what's on the horizon that's a good question i am Really excited because I came to the Salt Lake Beauty and Barber Expo as myself this time, mm. as my own brand. I educated on stage as Jessica Powers, which... Jessica Superpowers. <laughs> it's really awesome. That's pretty cool. And uh, I knew I wasn't going to cry, but I feel like that it was really awesome because my kids were here. And they saw me educate for the first time on stage as my own brand. So it was really cool. And then yeah. the salon is here too. And we have a booth, which was crazy. <laughs> Taking on all of that, like being an educator and having a model and having to prep and do all of that stuff for a show is a lot. And then um, having a booth is a lot too. But it's been really freaking cool to see all the girls at the booth doing demos and knowing that they can do it off of their like own brand too so um what's next um i i don't know i really want i've been think i guess i do know <laughs> but i really have been thinking about um bringing more mentorship to people outside of the salon on a bigger scale too. Um, while I was educating on stage yesterday, it wasn't about the brand or the technique for me. It was about inspiration and sharing my story and helping others to not get so much in their head about things and understanding that we all start somewhere. Also, I want to say that my books were full for those three days a week um, and booked out after three months of only being here. And I had under a thousand followers on my Instagram when that happened. So I think a lot of people compare themselves and you hear the saying like comparison is the thief of joy. And I think and I try to bring this to the salon and all of them when they're feeling defeated or, or don't want to post or are not posting for the reason that they want to post for and doing it for something else. And they get defeated in their comparisons. And I said, look, you have 600 followers on your Instagram. What if all 600 of those followers were hitting you up tomorrow and needing to get in this month? Right. I tell you what, I was a, a fan of Jessica Powers' work, <laughs> but now I'm a huge fan of Jessica Powers, the person. Thank Absolutely. you. Uh, 
Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, Jess. Thank, thanks so much for taking time out this weekend and sitting with us. We really appreciate it. Because because those at home, we, we we literally attacked her and said, "Hey, girl, we need to make some time." And then she made time for us, and, yeah. and, and that, that's awesome. Yeah, we just appreciate you so much. And and like Tony said, I'm just going to reiterate what he said. Like you are a different light to me now. Like 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 really big fan of you and what you're up to and, and all those things and thank you. really appreciate yeah. the time that you spent with us mrs jessica powers thank you very very much for joining us on your day off. thanks for listening if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast share it with friends give us a rating and drop a review to listen to all the latest podcasts please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet and to stay connected on and off the show you can follow us at hair Distry on instagram and all other social media platforms thanks again and we'll see you next time peace and love